All righty. Okay, so is this, okay, good. Um, all right, uh, so welcome to week three of Introduction to Sociology. Um, this week, we now delve into the realm of theory. Um, this is part one of two weeks on theory. Um, so logically, and in the order of the textbook, we'll begin with classical sociological theory, uh, building on some of those foundational philosophical principles and names we discussed last week. So you'll see Hobbes and Montesquieu, uh, names I said that we would go in more depth on this week, um, building our way up to what is often seen as the holy trinity of sociological thought, or the three major thinkers uh, of Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. Uh, names you'll see in any sociology class in any program. Um, so before we begin, I just want to go. I want to just uh, go over a few announcements that have been made. Um, so. I sincerely apologize for uh, many of the Revel issues that we've been experiencing. So, uh, so Revel, issue number one, uh, many students emailed me and, and Jason and Andrew and Sarah about their quizzes as showing up as incomplete. Uh, that's because even though I put the shared writing as worth no points, for some reason uh, Revel still counted them as part of the quiz. Um, so starting from uh, this week on, so you've done quiz one and quiz two, starting from quiz three, the shared writing will no longer be uh, available at all. Um, so this will er erase a lot of the confusion. Um, so this way you can see, you know, if you've done half the quiz questions, it'll show you as being 50% complete rather than some kind of random percentage. Um, so again, shared writing will go away after, after this week. Um, and then announcement number two, um, Sarah will be holding her office hours this Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. in MW324. I strongly encourage those of you that are, the majority of you that are first years, to go to her office hours. It's a great time to get to know her better. Uh, again, someone who will be um, one of your peer mentors throughout the entire year. Uh, and she can share a lot of her advice and knowledge about the campus and let you know about a lot of things that you, you really shouldn't miss uh, over, the, over the course of the year and throughout your undergraduate experience. Um, and just one last point of clarification about the quizzes. Um, they are graded. Um, I know maybe some other classes have them as uh, participation. Um, so the tutorials are more like that. The tutorials are kind of, if you participate, you get full credit. Uh, the quizzes are graded. Um, and again, the intention there is not to be nasty or anything, but to encourage you to take them very seriously. Um, again, there's some leniency built into them in that if you get a question wrong, you can try it again and still get points. Um, so try to, uh, the average was very good on the first one, um, I think like 85. So tr uh, continue doing as you're doing. And if you didn't do so well, then um, you know, come talk to me in office hours or with your TA about strategies for, for reading the text um, a bit differently perhaps. Um, okay, last announcement before we get into the realm of exciting theory. Um, I'll post this as a separate slide on uh, Quercus as well. Um, so the sociology launch pad is something that I think the previous professor of this course uh, started pioneering. Um, so you'll see on this slide, which is available, it's already available on Quercus in, in the slides for this week, um, you'll see there are a series of events hosted by the sociology department uh, or the academic advising and career center. Um, so just one of these that I already know. Uh, so getting ready for, for grad school um, and uh, getting meaningful work and volunteer experience. Uh, these are a bunch of sessions that are designed again, just like Sarah's session, uh, to familiarize you with things that you can do on campus. Uh, maybe slightly closer towards your graduation, um, but it's good to start thinking about these things early. Um, and again, seeing um, other of your peers that are going through the process. Um, okay. All right. Um, so theory. We're delving into theory. So why is theory, first of all, taught in the textbook? And second, why is it important, from my perspective, to learn? 
Um, so a theory, not just in sociology, but in any discipline, a theory is a way of seeing how seemingly separate phenomena or objects that seem discrete and isolated. A theory allows you to see these things, this stuff, as connected. Theories force you to engage with the question of what is going on here? What is making these things tick? What, is there any connection between A to B? Or to A to Z and all that's in between? So theories are about connecting. Um, and the reason we want theoretical explanations of things is that in any academic, sci in any science or any field, we would love to be able to predict events. So, and this isn't just in academic fields, we do this in our own life too. So we all have kind of what are called lay or everyday theories about how the world works. So, for example, I have a running theory that the way that I lecture and the way that I come across is related to what you'll think of me. So I try to be coherent. Um, I try to be somewhat fun and relatable. Um, and my theory f is that if I do these things, I'll connect with you. You'll keep coming to class as you are. Um, and there won't be like a revolt or a mutiny of everyone going online and being like, worst prof ever, epic fail. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. So, my th so by the end of the course, I'll see whether my theory that m I, I can control kind of the flow of the course by acting in a way that I'm hoping is appropriate, I'll see if that theory, that, that me somewhat controlling the course and being in dialogue with you, will not result in some catastrophe. Um, I'll see if that theory is valid. Um, so, and, you, and we all have many other theories about things, um, about the way we treat our friends, the way other, the, uh, you know, our theory about how we might do well in school. Well, I have a theory. If I do all the course readings, I do the quizzes, I, I, ask, for, I ask help when I feel something's unclear. I have a theory that doing those things will lead to me doing well in the course. Um, and we're, we're this week and next week, we'll see a whole bunch of theories that are designed to address much larger questions than just, you know, how well am I teaching a course or how well am I doing in a course? Um, but, but we'll see fundamental questions around the nature of how we think, how we act, how societies got the way they were, why people obey or disobey norms, all sorts of things. Um, but so again, theory, think of it as something that is not some Students often get intimidated by theory, thinking, oh, why am I learning all of this highfalutin stuff? I just want to know, you know, give me some facts, give me some data. Theories are behind any sort of data you have, any claim. Uh, they're often implicit assumptions, again, of how things are connected, how they're related. Um, and in sociology, we have the benefit, since we survey people, and we go out and talk to people, and we observe people, we can test all, um, the, the theories that we use. So you'll see, again, Marx, Weber, Durkheim, why they're often seen as the pioneers of the field is they generated theories that continue to guide our sociological imagination today. The kind of questions we ask and also the kind of questions we, we don't really ask so much. Um, so your job in all of this is to see, again, just as how I may have a theory of how to run this course, Someone else could have a different theory. You know, someone that's been a professor for 20 or 30 years might say, no, you know, the, what you're doing won't work for blah, blah, blah reason. Um, so you'll see that uh, we're going to be talking about many different thinkers throughout the course, and they each have their own theories about the same questions and the same phenomenon. So every theory has, in a way, a counter theory. Just as how every position has a counter position and every point has a counterpoint. One thing you'll learn over your, your time in, in university and the undergrad is that almost everything is debatable. Um, and it's very hard to find something that's just totally factually true 100% of the time. People debate things all the time. Um, so in this course, again, theories are introduced early to get you in the mindset 
of using that sociological imagination and scrutinizing the things that you learn and thinking, is this the only way I could be seeing this? Or is it actually theoretical and up for debate? Um, so, as I said, the theories that are discussed and the thinkers we'll discuss in this course, we can't discuss everyone, but we'll discuss the ones that I think have, you know, they kind of resonate when you talk to a sociologist. There's like a repertoire of names that come up. Um, and the textbook was good at, I think, picking the core ones. Um, so these thinkers that will be discussed, uh, you know, broadly were interested in human behavior, um, but you'll see three core themes guiding the questions they asked and kind of what they were all about. Um, so this is people, domain number one, obviously human interaction involves people. Going back to last week and Mr. Compte and his three stages, remember he said human sociality and the emergence of society and early forms of human behavior and, and everything kind of reduced to or, or were sparked from our relationship with God and religion, the theological stage. Um, so any discussion of people, you'll see when you go back hundreds of years, involves discussions about God or deities or myths. Um, and, and asking that question of, you know, does our human agency, do our institutions, uh, do they really come from us or are they coming from some sort of divine right? Um, so people and God, and then ultimately now you'll see, now that, you know, modern societies are much more secular, often the God part doesn't get asked quite as much unless it's relegated to like a discussion of religion. Um, but that general question uh, about society, again, is are our norms, values, laws, codes, institutions, all of these things that involve multiple people, are they beneficial for us? Should they be changed? Um, or should we kind of just let them run their course? Um, we'll see that question of whether institutions should be left alone or whether we should actively be intervening with them uh, creates kind of a dividing line between uh, the so, uh, sociologists and philosophers. Um, you'll see that as well in current politics as well, people that, um, you know, kind of trust the quote-unquote status quo uh, more so than people that are highly critical of it or the current state of affairs. Okay, so we'll begin our theoretical adventure with the philosophical roots. And as I promised, each of these little thinkers or giants that, we, that I mentioned last week uh, will be discussed in more detail. Although, again, tailored to the fact that this is a sociology course and not a philosophy course. So I'm just going to try to give you the most important bits of information, again, to round out your sociological imagination. And the little pictures there, I think, are helpful. Um, so, oh, and just for the legend, so remember, <laughs> the people's people, the hand is God, and then that little circle thing is society. So you'll be seeing different, different uh, little graphs or whatever you call these uh, diagrams come up. Um, so Hobbes, as mentioned last class, he, uh, you know, he theorized his, his famous book was The Leviathan, and he was really interested as a political philosopher, so a philosopher who studied um, states and, and politics and governance systems. He was, his general question really was, uh, why have states um, emerged the way that they have? You know, why do different countries have governments? Why do they tend to have similar structures? I mean, there are, there are differences in political structures, as you'll learn in the course, in our, in our week on politics. Don't worry so much about that now. Um, there, there are different structures, but they do have political structures, and they have similar, very many key similarities. He wanted to know why there was this kind of relative uniformity. Um, ultimately, he argued that the state is erected or formed or constructed through mutual consent. Um, people, at whatever time, come together around their shared acknowledgement that giving up some of our own autonomy ultimately is a good thing. Um, because if we were all totally autonomous, under his assumption that people were self-interested and that people pursued power, which he kind of just came to the conclusion of through, you know, studying history, through his 
theory and his perspective. He saw history is full of struggle, full of fights, full of conflict. He said, well, I think the state largely forms by people getting together and saying, you know what, there's a lot of things to be fearful about from one another. Uh, people overtake one another's lands, they fight, they kill one another. So establishing a state, or what he called a leviathan, is a way to make sure that people don't run amok and run, run ramshot over one another. Um, so you have like a police force, a government, laws and codes, and these prevent you from infringing on the rights and liberty of others. So the central kind of Hobbesian paradox, or the Hobbesian question of order, which you might see, again, if you take philosophy or po political science classes, is how is it that we've reached a place where individuals want to give up some of their liberty or power in order to ultimately have more power? Um, so again, if you're left to your own, maybe you can do whatever you want. Remember our discussion of agency and structure. If, let's say I put... I'm in a video game and I give myself level 100 agency and I can just run around and do whatever but then everyone else has level 100 agency and they can go and like kill me in the game on, ga on day one um, and, and you know and cyber bully me and whatever the hell and, and, so, and then so I'm like ah so you set up some rules and then you say ah no you can only do things that actually don't impact other players so in a video game it would be setting up like no griefing rules and no flaming and you can't troll one another and all this stuff um, so Hobbes was against trolling, ultimately. Um, okay, so trolls. So you have the Hobbes and kind of the anti-troll theory. Then we move on to Locke. Um, so I said Locke introduced many ideas that were very important to the discipline. Um, so rather than have this kind of basic like troll assumption that Hobbes had that people are nasty to one another. He's famous for his line of life without the state is nasty, brutish, and short. Um, he thought we'd die early because we'd run over one another. Locke said, hey, we've kind of left God out of this image. Um, again, the time period he's writing in, you know, the 1600s, uh, this, this was a time when people th really, I mean, you know, it's still debatable now, um, but this was a time when the dominant thought just around the emergence of the Enlightenment, in Western circles anyway, was really that life and the world as we know it are endowed by God. This was before kind of discussions of evolution. Um, and so Locke said, well, you know, the, the idea that we follow Leviathans and we establish states and orders, the fact that this is so uniform, you know, why do you have to think that it's some aversion to self-interest? Because if we were really so averse to our own brutality, why wouldn't we just want to be really brutal all the time? Like, why would we set up a state? Um, so, so Hobbes doesn't fully answer that. So Locke says, well, okay, we know we come from God. And moreover than that, when you look at how people develop over their lives, you see that they're what he calls, quote unquote, tabula rasa, that we're all kind of born very blank, um, and we, we, we don't really have a much perception of ourselves or the world, and we learn that over time. And this comes, again, through studies, you know, his own philosophical musings and other people at the time, looking again at how people's values change throughout their life, um, how people can start out in one place and then end up another. Um, you know, the, 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 the colloquial saying that, you know, kind of as you get older, you become more wise, people change, all of that. Um, so he, he said, rather than start with this weird kind of selfish human nature, we start out blank, um, and God controls much more of our lives. This will be very important as the course progresses, this idea of the blank slate or tabula rasa, the textbook goes in detail on that, um, because as you'll see, sociologists, part of why we're very interested in social change and studying institutions is that we tend to believe um, the human mind is quite malleable and subject to change um, and that people's values and beliefs rather than being necessarily innate like what Hobbes was implying are more a product of where they are and who they know and the institutions around them. Um, so again this will be a lot to take in for now but just think of this this is kind of a, a central polarity in social thought. Again, are we driven more by innate things or by um, the, the structures that are conditioning, um, you know, the, the blank slates that Locke claims we are. 
Um, so right on that note, so going even further than Locke, so we've gone from thinking humans form society to then God forms both society and humans and people. Montesquieu goes, he is really, as much as Comte started the discipline, Comte highly draws on Montesquieu's central insight. So Montesquieu wrote, he wrote a few famous books. I think the two in the textbook they talk about are the Persian letters, um, where, where he kind of pretended people were in another country being confronted with their laws, and, and it made them seem strange. Um, but he's more famous for his book called The Spirit of the Law. Um, and so building off of Locke, he said, okay, well, the, the issue of God is debatable and we can't really prove that. You know, in science, we have to be able to falsify. Um, we can't really falsify or verify questions about deities and gods. Um, but what we can falsify and verify, uh, verify are questions about laws. These are objective codes that are present in every society once they establish, you know, writing and some governance structures. And so Montesquieu believed, he said, well, okay, everything Hobbes and Locke and other social thinkers are talking about, things that are innate or things that are from God, why don't we see them as coming from the laws and norms and values and customs that are present in a given society? So the way of life in a society provides people, um, you know, the, the, the kind of labor market you have, the, he was more specific on, he was more focused on actual laws, like, you know, not being able to commit adultery or murder or rape or incest or those sorts of things. Um, but that perspective really spiraled, I think, as you can see, into a more general sociological imagination of saying, okay, well, let's get rid of these more philosophical and theological questions and see human behavior as the product of society. So again, you have people making society, then God making society and people, but now society makes people. Um, so lastly, so is it so simple as that? Um, remember, we talked about structure and agency, and so this was to kind of preclude this. Um, you know, if you say society creates people, it makes us think that we don't really have very much power to change things, right? If it's kind of, oh, you know, we're just learning all the stuff in our society, we're following the laws, our whole sense of self is shaped by our institutions. So Rousseau circles back all the way to Hobbes. He has the same picture, people create society. He was in debate with all of these thinkers, but mostly with Hobbes. And he said, you know what? Hobbes was really close. He, he thought, you know, obviously society starts with people. We're the ones that make society. I mean, sure, there's some point to saying, you know, the laws, structure, what we can do. But ultimately, we're the ones that made society. Not us, but our ancestors. Um, and, you know, we, we can change laws right now, too. So Rousseau said, okay, well, the only issue with Hobbes' theory, really, was he started off with the wrong assumption of human nature. He thought we were self-serving. But if we're creating all of these societies and all of these laws and norms, doesn't that make you think we're maybe more altruistic and more peaceful? Why would a, a self-serving organism or whatever we are, why would we create things that would bind us? Wouldn't we want to be more fracted, uh, you know, separate? Um, so Rousseau says we are peaceful and autonomous and we seek equality. And so laws and norms and values are ways of integrating us. Um, so these, again, are just four of many philosophers and social thinkers in the Enlightenment period, um, but they represent a kind of general schism or fracture in social thought, which continues to this day. Again, we'll see it when we look, namely, at functionalism versus conflict theory. But these assumptions, again, around largely around people and society, but you'll see God come in as well, but, but sociology's moved, um, it's become much more secular. Uh, some people are still very interested in that, but it's not the dominant argument anymore. Um, but this, this chart I've just included here, these involve uh, some central debate points in the field. Um, so the Enlightenment. Um, ultimately, uh, Enlightenment thinkers Again, the, the, the one kind of exception 
the two kind of exceptions here uh, of Locke and Montesquieu that, that thought God or society uh, were a little bit more impactful on our behavior. Um, a core assumption in Enlightenment thinking is, again, the rejection of the theological stage, the rejection of um, seeing our actions as outside of our control, and saying, actually, society is created by humans. This can be evidenced by using critical thinking and the scientific method. So l comparing different societies, seeing how humans value different things over different times, even within the same society, seeing how different societies value different things. Um, and the Enlightenment promotes, because of this focus on how we can create things, it, it focuses on strengthening individual powers. Um, so the question in the Enlightenment, remember, not to make this too historical, but the Enlightenment, you know, Britain and other countries coming out of their relative dark ages were very questioning about power and order. Uh, they were very critical of power and order, Criti and, and religion was an ordering mechanism. So these were a group of thinkers that were saying, you know, we can't just be pushed around by society and by those in power anymore. We have to really use our minds and work our way out of this and think, is this how we should be living? So on that note, individual liberty, democracy, people voting for who's in power, people having a say for those laws, um, and egalitarianism, getting rid or diminishing things like right by birth. Um, so just because you're born in a royal family to Enlightenment thinkers doesn't mean that you should just, uh, you know, have a, have a totally inflated sense of yourself and view of life. You shouldn't just automatically be able to do things that other people can't do. Um, everyone should be seen as part of the people of the country and able to do things on their own. Now, this kind of celebration of the individual and rejection of the collective or society, you can imagine how that would elicit a very, very strong reaction from a wide array of people. So the more obvious criticism could be, okay, well, the elites of the society, the kings um, and the royal families who you're saying shouldn't be born into their positions, they're obviously going to be critical. But importantly, for thinking, for exercising your sociological imagination, it's not just the people at the top that are very critical of this position as well, but it's people across all ranks in the hierarchy. Many people in any time period, and the Enlightenment is no different, they start to believe in the society that's around them. Remember, C. Wright Mills was critical of people who weren't critical of society. He called them cheerful robots. Well, C. Wright Mills wrote that book in 1959 because many people do just kind of want to follow what society teaches them. Um, you know, not everyone wants to be radical and, and doubt things. Um, as I said, and, and as you'll learn in psychology classes, most of our behavior is highly habitual and automatic. Again, thinking of myself, <laughs> as much as I can, um, you know, talk about my own individual liberty um, and changing my life course, um, I'm still very structured by my early experiences with video games. Um, so people, to make it relatable to the past, people that have learned a religion, um, that have come to believe that elites are more worthy than them, they not only are just indoctrinated by those views, but they actually come to believe those things. Um, there's a concept called noblesse oblige um, that, that talks about the relationship between the upper class and the lower class and how many lower class individuals historically um, felt they deserved to be lower class. Um, so people adapt to their situations. So the conservative reaction to the Enlightenment one is saying you are assuming that people actually are going to be highly critical of society and that that's a good thing but maybe people are kind of happy how things are. And we're being, um, you know, we're overstepping our bounds, telling people how to live to boost their freedom when they're happy with their societies as they are. Um, so this has the opposite perspective as well. It says, rather than looking at the individual power to create society, the conservative reaction says, well, look at all the things that are possible through society. Um, the laws that you're criticizing, those enable you to do so many things. 
uh, whenever you criticize something, maybe uh, you'll see this in functionalism, maybe when you criticize something, you're not seeing the full picture. You're not understanding why it emerged. So something you disagree with, think, well, it evolved for a reason. So here, you'll see, so the central dividing points, I would say, when you're thinking of conservative reactions in general, in, in philosophy and politics, are number one, the question of individual versus social or individual versus collective. Um, who should have more power and why? Should we really be highly critical of our institutions as individuals or should we trust that the institutions know what's best? Um, second, to what extent can the scientific method actually answer these questions about what's best for us to do? Um, so, again, the, the risk of changing institutions is that you may not realize some of the latent functions that those institutions hold, and I'll get to that later. Um, but that was a central question in the birth of sociology, because as we were moving away from religion, many studies started to find, hey, <laughs> now that people don't believe in religion, they're becoming much more depressed because they don't know how they should be living their lives. So again, that's what's called a, a latent function, as we'll see. Um, and then in terms of the kind of state they endorse, Enlightenment thinkers say, again, everyone has this beautiful capacity for critical thought, scientific reasoning. Let people live that way um, and be egalitarian. Again, meaning give people equality of opportunity and things will kind of work out well. Um, the conservative reaction says, well, okay, it's one thing to say to make things egalitarian and equal now, but people that are of the higher ranks are deserving of the positions that they're in, and there could be a lot of negative reaction among the public if you shake things up too much. Um, so again, these are, these are tw uh, huge kind of binaries. Um, no one today fully supports kind of either position um, I that you'd read in, in this class or, or in sociology 100%, um, but they are anchoring points for thinking the kind of questions people ask. Thinking about the kind of questions people ask. Um, so you'll see there are three core uh, schools or bodies of theory that we will be discussing in this course. There are many sub-theories within these. Um, but these three core theories or these three core schools are founded by three people who all were engaged in these sorts of questions and rested on one of the two sides a little bit more clearly. Um, so Durkheim was part of that conservative reaction. As we'll see, his main, his main question was, okay, if we give up our old laws, if we challenge the status quo, that may be very good, but what about all the people that believe in those laws? What happens to them? Um, so he fits on the conservative reaction side a little bit more, as we'll see. Again, although none of these people are pure. Marx, much more on the Enlightenment side. He says, well, if we use our capacity for scientific reasoning for doubt, we will see that societies are, are universally founded on inequality uh, and undeserved merit. And so Marx wants to scrutinize social structures and societies um, and really get at that egalitarianism that many Enlightenment thinkers wanted. Um, and then more in the middle, we'll see um, a theory or, or a school of theories that's really been taking off in sociology in the last 40, 50 years um, called symbolic interactionism. Um, and this really blends both sides and is the more middle, grain, middle ground. Um, so as I said, most sociologists kind of wouldn't really be totally polarized um, because I think this, this newer perspective um, addresses kind of the limitations of both schools. Um, and so for, for symbolic interactionists, um, yes, individuals have the power to create society, but, so, but individuals already all live in societies. Um, so we have this ability to, to be active agents, but our active agency is structured by where we live. Um, and so rather than see social structures as totally enduring um, and resistive of change, or seeing all of us as having to like uh, remake the wheel uh, every life cycle, symbolic interactionists say, okay, 
We tend to reproduce the institutions that we live in. We tend to go with the flow, but we don't have to. And so we need to think, when does it make sense to call for change? Um, and if we are going to call for change, what will that actually look like? Oops. Okay. So any questions? I know I've been giving a whole multiple mouthfuls on all of this. Any questions so far? We're going to go into these three main schools, again, of functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism. <coughs> all righty. Okay, so functionalism. Um, so the core idea in functionalism, again, coming back to the conservative reaction, um, and, oh, sorry, there's a lot of talking going on. Sorry, I just, um, again, if you whisper, I can hear it, and it's distracting. Um, so the, um, the core assumption in functionalism comes from the name of the perspective. So this, the, the core premise in functionalism is that the institutions that we have, or the society that we have, um, fit together in an organic way. So functionalists argue that you should see society, any society you're looking at, as a living organism. So any part that it has, say a law about incest, a taboo on incest, or an education system, or a capitalist labor market, whatever the part of society it is, it's connected with everything else in that society. And it exists in, a, in what's called a functional symbiosis, meaning that even if you don't see necessarily outright how they're connected, they are connected. And just like how you may not see how your kidneys connected to like your brain or something right away, um, you, you could see your liver connected to your brain when you get drunk, but um, you, you don't see, you know, you don't necessarily think of all these connections in our body, but if you were to take out an organ, then it could have all these impacts on your body that you don't know. So, Again, this school was born out of criticisms of the Enlightenment, of saying, oh yeah, sure, it makes sense to get rid of some, some outdated law, but you don't know what might happen if you get rid of that law. You don't know what else that's preventing or what's that, what, what that's enabling. Um, so the functionalist perspective, again, uh, sees society as this living, breathing organism and sees the laws and codes that we have as evolving out of adaptations that people have made over time. Um, so again, it's very critical of seeing of social change, not because it necessarily is worshiping the status quo, but that thinkers in this perspective, following Durkheim, who we'll see, who's kind of the key functionalist, are very fearful that change might bring about unwanted consequences. So yes, we may want to change A to get B, but what if we change A and now we get C, D, E, F, and all these things, horrible things we don't want? Oops. Oh, that doesn't work very well. Um, okay, so the first functional theorist that we have, um, and this is a weird interactive slide that'll like move around a little bit. Um, not the, exactly the way I wanted, but it's kind of a life of its own. It's adapting. Um, so Herbert Spencer, was a key thinker. He wrote uh, kind of in the same time period as Comte. Um, and he was actually the person that coined, so why I have a picture of Darwin, sorry, I'll go back, it's moving. Why I have a quote from Darwin here um, is, is Spencer is actually the one that came up with the, the quote or the, or the saying, survival of the fittest. And so while Darwin was talking about individual organisms within species, um, you know, those that adapt to the, the, the quote up there, um, those that adapt to their climates and their situations um, will, and are actually able to reproduce will, will pass on their, their genes. And so um, species will evolve according to the victors. So those that have adapted, um, the, the, the adaptive survive. Um, it's often mistaken as, as the strong survive, but um, you don't necessarily have to be strong in some, you know, regular sense of the word, um, it means you have to be more adaptable and pliable to your, to your environment. Um, so Spencer, who actually created this term, he wasn't talking about individual organisms. He was talking about societies. Um, and what he believed was 
the laws that we have, the codes that we have, the styles of government that we have, all the things you, you would think of as a sociologist that we study now. He says, if those exist, it means they have functioned for that group of people to an extent. They've functioned better than things in the past. Now, this doesn't mean to Spencer or to Durkheim, as we'll see, that just because something is functioning, that means it's permanent. Um, institutions and laws and norms can change over time, but they will do so as the environment changes. So societies will react to ongoing changes in their environments. Thinking that you can come in as one philosopher or one thinker and change those laws is very different than having a society more organically come up with change. So that's complicated now, but you'll see that as we go later. Um, so Emile Durkheim makes this most clear. So Emile Durkheim is arguably seen as the number one founder of the discipline of sociology. He wrote shortly after the French Revolution, as did many other sociologists. His central question at the time was, was the French Revolution really good for French society? And more broadly, are the principles of the Enlightenment really beneficial for people to follow? The data that he collected himself led him to challenge um, or, or negate some of these questions or answer them negatively. Um, so he had a famous, famous book called Suicide. Um, and it was really this book that birthed modern sociology. Um, so he collected statistics on suicide rates in a variety of countries. It was the first quantitative, remember that word, numerical data collection, aggregate. He was the first quantitative study to measure human behavior in a real way. Um, and so he, analyzing this data, he found that countries with weaker religious values, but also countries with extremely strong religious regulation, had higher suicide rates. Relative countries with what he termed, you know, the textbook goes into more distinctions, um, but relative countries that had, you know, strong religions, but ones that didn't dictate people's behavior in a very clear way. Um, so societies with what he, was, what he called a moderate level of religion, um, they would have lower suicide rates. Now, how does this link to the French Revolution and the conservative reaction? Durkheim was in dialogue with philosophers like Hobbes um, and Herbert Spencer, and also many budding psychologists. And he argued that rather than seeing, so just like Rousseau and, and Locke argued that much of our behavior came from God and society and the laws, he said, okay, it's, it's great to think that enabling people to be very critical and self-aware and rational and all these things we already are, as much as you think that could help people, we really have to take people's values and norms seriously. And the French Revolution, like many other thinkers, Edmund Burke, um, Max Weber to an extent, they were very skeptical of the philosophes of the Enlightenment, saying, you know, people really do want all of these um, rational things, and society makes no sense, and let's change it, and let's revolt. Durkheim said, well, a lot of people don't want that. Um, and even if they did, they wouldn't know how to articulate that. And most importantly, they wouldn't even know what that means or what to do with that. People that, you know, have a family or going to church, if you take the church away from them, you tell them it's stupid, you tell them you're in a scientific era now, what are they really going to do? Are they just going to blindly believe you? Um, so he found, again, looking at that data, he said in societies where religion had weakened kind of quickly, people were killing themselves. They suffered what he called anime. Um, so this was, a f and this relates very much to today. Um, and not just about religion, but about a whole bunch of things. As I said, I'm interested in how people find meaning in their lives. Um, and that largely comes from my reading of Durkheim. Um, so he said, he's like, he said, well, what's missing in this discussion of individual capacity 
is this kind of automatic search for meaning that we all have. That we're a social species, but we're also very religious in the sense of not just you know, following an actual codified religion, but of wanting to have a deeper sense of connectedness with our worlds. And so he found that this enlightenment criticism was too harsh on that aspect of the person. He said people often don't really know why they want to follow the rules and laws around them, but they do, because it makes them feel connected. And so if you take that away from them right away, they might be lost and experience what he called anime. Again, this feeling of normlessness. So that relates very much to today and my own research on careers. You know, when I interviewed people, and I know just from over the years of talking to students, you know, when you say, oh, I have no idea what I'm going to do in four years. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on doing this degree, but I don't really know. My parents are telling me to do this. I saw it worked out for someone else. Durkheim says, well, if you lived in a time where you know, society was much more controlling of your behavior, and they said, okay, this is what you do in this stage of your life. You go, you get this apprenticeship, you work at this company. Yes, you might feel very controlled. You might not have a whole bunch of agency, but that part of you that has a tendency to become confused and scared and fearful, that part of you would be a little bit happier. So I think, just from my own experiences, um, again, using what I said about wisdom, um, you know, people often feel most of our internal conflict, our existential philosophical conflict, is we want all of this capacity to do what we want, and that's great, and we feel upset when we can't do that, but we often sometimes just want to know what the hell to do. We don't want to be stuck in these conversations with ourselves thinking, oh, am I making the right choice? Um, is this the best thing I could have majored in? Are these the best friends? Is this the best job? Is this the best haircut? You know, whatever. Um, all of these doubts. And so Durkheim said, uh, we need to take those doubts seriously. Um, so looking at suicide rates again, he said when religion, when you kind of just take religion away from people, they often get depressed, they get sad, they get isolated, they don't know why they should be living. Um, he, he then typologized society around this too. So he said you can see society, again he was a functionalist, like Spencer saw societies as evolving. He said back when societies had very, very strong norms and codes, not like now where everyone's kind of debating everything all the time, but when, when, when you really couldn't, if, like if you would be executed for talking against the state, um, you lived in what was called mechanical solidarity. Um, so mechanical in the sense that you didn't really, like the things weren't necessarily connected, so the, uh, but you didn't think about it. Um, so uh, where, where, let's say, uh, in a mechanical society, you have a very strong religion, let's just use Western history, you have Protestantism um, or Christianity, um, and then you have rules and laws in society based around that religion, um, so about marriage, about divorce, about homosexuality, about childcare, all of these things. Um, and you connect with people over, because of the fact that you follow the same rules and laws as them. Um, you don't necessarily have some huge conscious meaning um, or, or know why you're connecting with people, but you know you just view them as similar. Now, organic solidarity was what started to emerge in Durkheim's time of writing and what led him to be critical of some of those Enlightenment principles. Again, not debating them, but saying maybe we are moving with these principles too quickly. Maybe we have to take what's already existing a little bit more seriously because people will. Um, so organic solidarity is once um, societies reach a level of complexity where there are more occupations, there are more social roles for people to fill, there are more debatable laws and norms and customs in the society. Um, in, 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 an, uh, in an organically um, built society, all of our institutions, and this is key for functionalism, remember seeing society organically um, and as having a bunch of institutions that are necessary to one another. Um, in, in organic solidarity, he sees each piece of society as fundamental to each other piece. Um, so this makes sense if you think of examples here. So 
Think of the education system that we have now. We'll have a question about education later and some of its uh, consequences. Um, but think of the education system that we have now and think of the capitalist labor market that we have. Um, you may view these, this in a mechanical way, saying, oh, this is just what you know, Canadian history gave us, um, happened to be this way. Um, but if you look at it in an organic way, you would say, okay, in our current economy, scare, resources are scarce, different jobs and different skills are valued differently. People get educations, and they get educations that are valued differently. Um, certain education programs are more competitive to get into. And part of that is that they are assumed to get you better jobs in the labor market. So clearly anyone going to school now is thinking of the labor market. So that's an example of organic solidarity. Um, things you do in one domain in your mind should be connected to other things going on in society. They're connected, they're organic. Um, so you can see to a functionalist like Durkheim, he would say, okay, um, let's say we change the nature of the economy and we make it so that you don't need a degree to get whatever job you want. What do you think might happen to the university? Would people take a lot of the harder programs or programs that are seen to be hard, but that yield very good jobs? If you could get those jobs without the education, you may not want the education. Um, so that's one example of seeing two institutions that maybe seem separate, seeing them as connected in terms of their outcome. Um, and so we'll have a question about this before the break. Um, so again, so the, the hierarchy or, uh, of ideas in terms of functionalism, again, there's a lot to digest. So I'm trying to give you, you know, and these are things for years I've, I've been struggling with myself, so I can't give you, you know, I wish I could give you some TED Talk style clear example. Um, but really I think functionalism again is saying change is A-OK, -okay, but you have to really think about the consequences. And part of that is that society is so messy and all these things are connected in ways you may not think. And any one person with all of their criticisms, again, sociology is about looking at perspectives, multiple perspectives and being partial. Anytime you could be critical about an institution, think of someone else that enjoys it, even if it's someone you disagree with. And think again, if, if they're disagreeing with it, why and who are they representing? Again, these are become political questions. And so Merton is the kind of last functionalist, very, very influential uh, in contemporary sociology. He was a contemporary of C. Wright Mills, wrote in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And they were, you know, they're very, very different um, in their view of things. C. Wright Mills was very radical, Merton not so much. Um, and the reason he was not so radical was this idea that he introduced of latent functions, absolutely key for understanding thinkers like Durkheim. Um, so he said, there is a difference between the manifest or explicit reason for something existing and all of the unintended consequences of what it's doing. So a manifest function is, okay, the education system, well, I won't, sorry, I'll stop using that as an example because I want to ask you questions about that, um, but I'm, I'm being kind of one track minded. Um, so I'll just make it personal again because that's easy for me to do. I don't have to think about that. So a manifest function of me playing my video games, my fighting games, is to become, or at the time, was to become a pro gamer, earn money that way, kind of, you know, reject my parents and all these things. A latent function of me playing video games, however, an unintended consequence of me playing video games was me falling out of the education circuit, starting to really doubt my ambitions, doubt myself, become like very depressed in adolescence, and then ultimately now be in school for way too long because I've like gone completely the other route. Um, so you can think about that in your own life again, and I strongly encourage you with these theories. Um, they, they're very complex when you think of them at the societal level, um, but all of them are translatable to the individual. Um, so in society, again, too, the idea of, um, you know, a capitalist labor market, you think, okay, let's have a series of occupations that you can list in terms of skills and requirements, and then let people apply to them. So a manifest um, function of that is the labor, having a capitalist labor market allows people to choose the jobs that they want. A latent function of that sort of labor market, though, is inequality. 
many people will not be able to get high paying jobs to the same extent that other people can based on things like racism and sexism and ageism and all of these things that we have to deal with. Um, and hierarchies can be created across occupations. So again, I have a course called Deviant Careers. And that was born out of the idea that, you know, being a gamer was not seen as something prestigious because it wasn't going through the normal channels of society. So a latent consequence of the labor market was labeling and valuing of different careers and lifestyles. Um, so Merton, again, in terms of the conservative reaction, says for every institution, we can't just look at the value or the result that we think it should yield, but we have to look at all these other things that could just accidentally and contingently be coming out of it. And that's why, I'll leave it on that note, but that's why to a functionalist, they are so scared of social change and people coming in and shaking up society because they think, well, if you get rid of that, the organism might die. Um, you know, if you get rid of this value, what if, what if, like Durkheim found with religion and suicide, what if that was a huge thing that people liked for some other reason that you just didn't know? So, so some things are much easier to think to change, like the examples I'll use, like, you know, sexist laws and uh, bigoted laws. Those are much clearer. Um, but there are, there are murkier ones, um, as we'll see as the course progresses, uh, that people are much more divided on. Um, so before the break in the question, again, the major criticism of functionalism, I'm giving a little bit more of a... Ooh. No, I'm sorry, is it okay? Oh, good. Okay. Um, see, latent, right there, latent consequence, drop in your laptop, thinking it's disturbing the class, but it's not. I'm concerned for your laptop. So, um, okay, and it gives me an opportunity because I lost my train of thought and then I could just kind of, whatever. So, um, criticism is a functionalist approach. Now, I'm giving much more of a defense of functionalism than I will the other perspectives only because it's so routinely attacked. Now, I'm not some big endorser. I don't endorse any of these theories, but um, I don't just want a simple dismissal of this because of, again, um, how foundational it was in the, in the discipline. We have moved largely beyond it for the criticisms list listed on the board, but again, we're not done with functionalism and people have a tendency to think functionally, um, which I think is good, um, but we need to, to think. When are we being functional, when not? Um, so the, the major criticisms of this is that fear of unintended consequences. Maybe that's not totally beneficial. Um, if you fear social change so much, then you may never want to change things. And how can things grow if you think, oh, well, I don't want to intervene as a sociologist. I don't know. Remember, that was C. Wright Mills' point. He said, like, what the hell kind of sociologist are you if you aren't actually concerned about changing society? So, of course, a criticism of functionalism is if you take that fear principle too far, then what are you doing? You're kind of just thinking of society and reveling in the complexity. Um, so, and so this was connected uh, with an implicit assumption. So we'll see conflict theory is the exact opposite. Uh, it's assuming that society is, is, remember, a key aspect in functionalism. I kind of glossed over it. But it was that society evolved into what it is because it's been benefiting the majority. But as you know, many populations, you just think of Canadian history, ethnic minorities, particularly aboriginals, is it fair to say that the that colonization in Canada, you know, boosted the majority of Aboriginals' lives? I think many people would debate that. So, um, you know, overemphasis of how much society represents the interest of a population. Um, and then, uh, again, um, often uh, overlooked the positive consequences. So you'll see that functionalism is based on fear Conflict theory is based on need for change and hope and being more optimistic that we can change things. So it's social justice oriented, whereas um, functionalist theory is rooting back to that Darwinian idea and, and Spencerian idea that, uh, well, I'm kind of scared to make a move, so let's just hope that things work out. So again, that's, that's kind of an extreme characterization, um, but you can think of it that way. Um, so before the break, um, and again, I'm sorry I'm going a bit slow, but this is, again, just it's very dense to think of, uh, to try to wrap everything up. Um, so just show of hands, um, true or false, 
the education system provides both manifest and latent functions. So who thinks that's true? Who thinks it's false? Oh, we have one false. Oh, a couple false. Okay, so we'll start with the, with, with the minority. So, why do you, so wh whoever thinks it's false, why do you think it's false? Does anyone want to? Perfect. So, because false, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you know, if you get the right education, people shouldn't use that education correctly. So, um, Great point. So education, the student's comment was um, maybe, and this is good to clarify the points too, um, the, the point was maybe education doesn't have manifest, both manifest and latent functions <laughs> because the manifest functions that it has aren't very good. Um, so the, again, the idea that in education you're learning uh, correct things, um, if that assumption is false, or if, you know, if, if education isn't being used by people, then maybe some of the manifest functions aren't actually present. Um, so that's a different take on the question, but, but it's good. Um, okay, and then last, the, the question I'll, I'll ask you um, before the break, again, sorry for the, for the delay, but I just want to get to it. Um, does anyone have any examples they'd like to share uh, about what they think some latent functions of the education system are, or some unintended cons perfect unintended consequences? I don't want to hit your laptop and have another laptop disaster. Um, so I think people who are in the uh, in the strip of the education system, the people who teach and the people who learn. Outside of that, people won't be able to, for example, get jobs if they don't have certain education. That would be a big problem. Mm -hmm. They will be sort of discriminated against just because they're not in the education system. Right, so great comment. So, major criticism of contemporary education. This, like, totally credentialist hell, where now, I mean, you know, now every job, uh, you, like, you're, you're going to see, and, and, and I'm not making fun of this, I, I love, I, always, I look up things too much, but um, there's, a, there's a program now, uh, you can have a certificate in therapeutic clowning. It's like a real certificate. And you know what that is, it's a, it's a very important job, but I didn't know it has a certificate. It's, um, you know, when clowns go to like hospitals for kids. But there's a certificate for that. There are certificates for everything and it's, and it's growing. And then you think, so you're gonna discriminate against me if I go to some other clown school, but I'm not a therapeutic clown. And so I, I don't know, so, but they, um, you know, where will it end is the question of the, of the latent consequence. And other things too, on a serious note, things like physician assistant, um, my sister's a pharmacist, and pharmacy tech was something that was, so that, that was like a pharmacist assistant that often high school students would do. Now you can't do that. You need a two-year certificate. And then the question is, well, what are they really learning? Because weren't they learning more in the apprenticeship? Um, so discrimination, long-winded way of saying, employment discrimination based on credentials um, is often seen as a bureaucratic kind of consequence of saying, well, I could have the skills, but I don't have the thing on paper, so I can't enter it. Um, one more, latent function, education system. So we have credentialization. Perfect. Um, I don't know if this is going to be a latent function, but the, um, the students have not get their education with jobs, but I know like university is not getting it. And so some are really intelligent and have to have a lot of but they can't pay Great point. So there's, I would call that slowly. Could be stratification um, and social sorting. So, or it's called, you'll, you'll see it later in the course, there's a term called the Matthew effect. Um, so it's kind of the rich get richer. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, there's one thing to say, okay, liberal education, as I said, we moved from it being on paper, being limited to the elites to now being open to everyone, but who can actually afford to do so? 
You also see the kinds of programs people take. Again, as someone that went to an adult school, most of my friends uh, took vocational programs. And people said to me, what are you doing taking sociology? You're not going to get a job with that. If I was much richer, um, then that question may not have been asked. Um, and so you know, that's, that's something you all might have. Well, I don't know all of you personally, but that's a question you might have to answer to people if they say, why are you wasting your time? You need to learn like a skilled trade. So, so most of my friends were taking nursing, um, plumbing, all sorts of things where they, they, they knew they could get a job. Um, and again, historically, that's been a latent function of the university, reinforcing the stratification that it's actually trying to get rid of. Um, so I think the education system serves as a good example because of, again, obviously it, it has a lot of great uh, positive outcomes um, but sociologically, as we'll learn in the course, especially in the week on education, there are a ton of negative consequences um, of, of the way that we've organized our education or that it's evolved over time. Um, all right, so when we get back, we will go from organic functional explanations to seeing power and conflict uh, center stage and then see all that murky stuff of symbolic interactionism. Hi. All right. Okay. All righty. Um, so, just as how society is adapt adapting and evolving according to functionalists, um, so is this course on a week by week basis. Um, so, because the break was a bit longer, um, with lots of great vibrant questions, I love all the excitement about the material, um, we'll be going uh, a little bit over time today. Not past, not the three hours obviously, but I mean um, maybe like 10 after the hour or so. Um, so you're free to go um, quietly if, if you have to go right uh, at, at, on the hour, but hopefully you'll stick around. Um, I'll try to be fast on that note too. Um, so, we've gone through uh, perspective number one, uh, again, probably the most difficult perspective to, of the three to understand, um, just, I mean, symbolic interactionism has some trickiness too, um, but, um, oh, I don't even, I sound loud, but my microphone's off, okay, oops, wrong one, I think I sound loud because I hear myself, I don't know how I sound to others, okay, do, do. Okay, sorry about that. I just, I just hear echoes, so I, I'm always sounding loud, and now I realize that has nothing to do with the microphone. Um, so, so what I, sorry, what I said was I'm going to be going a little bit over time today. If you have to leave right at the hour, you're free to do so as usual, but please do so quietly. I'd prefer, obviously, that you stay for the whole thing. I'm going to try to be quick. Um, so conflict theory, diametrically opposed to functionalism. So if functionalist thinkers were fearful to the point of paralysis when it came to social change. So if they said, we cannot as individuals be so smug as to say that we can change society because we barely have a handle on how things work ourselves um, and knowledge is, is up for scrutiny and debate and all of this, conflict theory pioneering with the work of Karl Marx in sociology, as we'll see, said there's no time for doubt. Based on all of the awful things going on in society, change is needed. And this stems from a difference on one central assumption about society. So, and, and goes all the way back, um, in a way, to Hobbes versus Rousseau. So remember, Hobbes said people are self-interested, self-preserving, and they'll war with one another and be nasty and brutal. And Rousseau said, no, they'll be peaceful and working along with one another. Conflict theory's central assumption is that this tendency to be self-preserving does exist, but it's actually socially constructed. So conflict theory sees, Marx has a famous quote, all of history is a history of class struggles. So he says, if you look at any society, you'll see that once it divided in a way where individuals were unequally located in that society, had different privileges, different advantages, different capacities, the societies unfolded in what's called a stratified or hierarchical way. So certain positions and certain people become valued and seen as respected and others not. 
So this position is at odds with functionalism because functionalism, again, is saying, you know, anything that exists is beneficial for the majority. Conflict theory, by definition, by putting power at the center of this and inequality at the center of this, says, well, beneficial for whom? Who have you defined as the majority? Again, if you're thinking of Canada, think of Aboriginals. If you're thinking um, of gender relations, think of men and women historically. If you're thinking of the states, think of African Americans. Think of populations that have historically been marginalized or others in countries. And then when you ask that functionalist question, oh, if, or look at that assumption of it's beneficial for the majority, you then can hear the Marxists of the world say, no, clearly the way you've been defining majority is the privileged majority. Look at all the people that don't see things functionally. Um, something, again, <laughs> even using functionalist logic, something that's functional could have latent functions. One of the latent functions of the way Canada developed and, and, and you know, it was overt in terms of colonization, um, but was the treatment of minorities and most clearly aboriginals. Um, so conflict theory, again, says fear, sure, things are complicated and messy, but things are very clear when you look at them in terms of power allocation and conflict and privilege and those sorts of things. Um, so Karl Marx, um, again, I only am using this word here because I know when you use, uh, so when I use jargon terms, it's not me trying to be jargony. I always make an attempt not to be, um, but I'm trying to explain words in the textbook that may be quite confusing. Um, so Marx's philosophy, again, so we've moved from Durkheim, the main founder, um, to Marx, who's, depending on who you're talking to, um, you know, one, two, or three of the three people we'll discuss, but he's, um, you know, always in the top three. Um, Marx, his, his central kind of philosophical concept that he uses is the notion of dialectic. And so that's really a kind of fancy way of, uh, uh, or another term for a feedback loop. Um, now, what he sees in society and what the term dialectic represents is that every society is a balance of oppositions. So rather, again, starting with that functionalist perspective that we, quote unquote, as a whole society, have institutions that we go into we do have that, and there is a we in some abstract sense. But Marx says, okay, rather than starting with the abstract population, why don't we look at how the actual population is differently organized? And then see society as the conflict between these groups. So dialectics is taking a different starting point. It's seeing anything that you have in any society is multiple groups competing over different things and different value systems. So a dialectical relationship even, if you think in, in terms of a broad public, would be the role of religion and the role of science in explaining humanity, right? To what extent does evolution explain our behavior? To what extent does religion? How do you combine these things? They are, they have, there's a tension clearly for many people between these. Um, there's also a tension between you know, uh, looking at things like structural inequality and people's inability or, or harder ability to enter into institutions, and then our idea that we've all learned of merit and individual responsibility. How do you balance being re individually responsible for things, but acknowledging that things may be more fair or less fair for you based on your ascribed characteristics? So dialectics, again, is seeing life as a balancing of tense forces, forces that are contradictory. Um, and so this related to the core philosophy that Marx was involved with and conflict theorists were involved with, um, which was Hegelianism. Um, so Hegel was a, a key philosopher, but that was very religiously uh, informed. And he believed that you know, a lot of the pain and strife and misery and things we were experiencing um, as humans with minds, um, that all of this was kind of us just amplifying our situations. Um, so me being upset about, you know, my life or whatever, if I saw myself as part of a divine plan, as part of a bigger plan, I wouldn't have to be so upset. If I realized 
um, you'll see that you know, the power of positive thinking comes from this philosophical perspective. It's good to be positive. I don't want people to leave here a bunch of you know, negative neds or something. But um, being positive is good. Um, but as, as you'll see with Marx, they said, ah, OK, saying that all our human misery is just a product of our mindset because it's coming from God, that's kind of a cop out. Um, that, exp that, that negates or doesn't do justice to how all of these people you're seeing that have positive mindsets, they also likely don't have dire poverty, and they're probably seen prestigious in their societies relative others. Um, so power and position um, influences people's mindset in a way where, you know, it's not fair to tell someone that's being ousted by their society, um, oh, just reframe your experiences because it's part of a divine plan. Um, so Marx flipped Hegel on his head. This is his famous quote. He said, rather than ideas shaping history, um, history shapes ideas. Um, and rather than ideas shaping how we interpret material means, material means, our access to things, our access to jobs, our access to resources, that shapes what we can think about things. Um, so the dialectic, again, is seeing these two things in tension. The fact that we live in a material world that is stratified, Different things are valued differently. Certain people are valued differently over time. Um, but also acknowledging that ideas fit in this too. That we do have agency and we can reframe things. So again, Marxist and conflict theory is not, you know, it knows that, that human consciousness is a latent function of a system as well. That we, that we can interpret things differently. But power is at the center. So again, Functionalism is often framed as being harmonious. That's one of the criticisms, it's that everything works together organically. Conflict is that we have competing institutions based on who happened to be elite at the time, who happened to form things, who happened to win a war, who happened to colonize, all of these things. Um, so in terms of the dialectic, you'll see, again, feedback loop. So you'll see the arrow kind of going both ways. Um, so for conflict theory, again, being a product of the Enlightenment, they're very focused on things you can scientifically test and verify and have hypotheses about. So a key thing in any society to a conflict theorist is that it has what's called a base. So every society has um, some sort of productive mechanism. Remember in the first lecture, I think, or last lecture, I talked about the, the significance of the Industrial Revolution. Now the Industrial Revolution had the manifest function, so I'll use jargon as, as we go to so familiarize you with it. The Industrial Revolution had the manifest function of boosting productivity, of giving people what Marx would call um, you know, surplus, having, having tons of stuff um, and more jobs and all of this. But a latent function of the Industrial Revolution was the fact that people were kind of ushered out of rural areas into cities brought a lot of decay, disease spreading, misery of people not being able to, to live according to their customs. Again, you could see a kind of conservative reaction of the Industrial Revolution. Um, but this centrality of the Industrial Revolution in shaping life was testimony to what conflict theorists called the base. So at every, at every level, when you look at a society, the way that it produces goods, the way that it allocates resources, is key to all of the sorts of values, norms, ideas, customs, all the things we'll learn in the week on culture. It's key to all of that stuff. So stuff being there is superstructure. Ideology, so governing ethos, remember a term I used before, um, a way of thinking about the world. Culture, what are, what are your values? What's, what's your, the group all about? That's highly based on the kind of things you're producing, what you view about labor, what you value, what you don't. The laws you develop. I, remember I, I talked about the Industrial Revolution and how it, homelessness, which was never a social problem, became a social problem in the West after the Industrial Revolution because factory owners and other people kind of influenced the, influencing the government at the time said, hey, we can't have all these guys, because it was really guys working in the factory at the time, we can't have all these guys laying about on the countryside rejecting factories. If we do, we won't have any bodies in our factories and we won't produce all these great things we want to produce. Um, so the, a law emerged out of that base. 
um, the politics we have, science, again, so the scientific revolution only happened once societies reached a productive level where you could have people not stuck in farms making all their own stuff, but able to sit and think and write the way that Marx did. And ironically, Marx could only do what he did because he was being financially supported by Engels. Um, so he was like sitting in a room being paid for by this, by this guy at the time. Even though, like they both were married, but they, they just were, they had like a classic bromance or something, I guess. Um, so they, um, I don't think there's any, yeah, I don't think anything else, I think they were just friends, but, but they have a, the people are studying their relationship. Um, so it's interesting, you know, philosophical drama. Um, so anyway, so our views of philosophy, art, family, all of these things to a conflict theorist come out of the resources that we have, um, as again, those provide room for all of this. Um, so again, I just in this slide, it's reiterating the things that I said. Um, the dialectic, again, complicated word, but it's, it, it helps make sense of conflict theory's perspective that society is extremely dynamic. Um, so functionalism, again, we're fearful of change because we don't know what it will yield. For conflict, for conflict theorists, change is imminent. It's going to happen anyway, because at, at its core, society is full of fights and turmoil. And so why don't we just take charge of the fight and gear the conflict, rather than letting the conflict kind of tear us apart from within? So again, these are philosophical positions. I know this isn't a philosophy class, but when you read things later in the course, you will see that everything comes, comes down to this idea or th these sets of ideas, am I assuming things are more harmonious? Am I harmonious? Am I assuming they're more conflict-ridden? And these are not, there's no right answer. People debate these a lot. Um, again, the textbook really criticizes functionalism, as most sociologists do. Um, but I think, again, and again, I, I'm, I'm just trying to teach things as they are and that I think will be helpful for you going forward. Um, but seeing the merits of, of every position, I think, will only do you better justice when, you're, when you come and you find yourself in these questions of thinking, is this policy really good? Should this be changed? Um, why ha and, and more importantly, why hasn't this policy that seems bad, why hasn't it been changed? Um, so you know, when, you when you think of things you see, um, think, oh, maybe the person's taking a functionalist perspective. Um, so Marx. So, I mentioned again the conflict theory perspective in sociology at least always comes down to him. He was the first person again to claim class is absolutely central, um, so class position in a society. Seeing societies as classed is absolutely essential to understanding human history and the way that civilizations grow. Um, and again, once societies uh, move away from nomadic living, um, so hunter-gathering kind of life, gatherer-hunting life, um, and they become sedentary, they have farms and all of this, um, and, and develop estates and royalties, and you know, varies across societies. But once it reaches this stage, what becomes clear is a key social division. And um, this is between what he calls the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Um, so recently, um, the Occupy movement uh, occurred. So show of hands, who heard of the Occupy movement? OK. Not many. Too young. Um, so Occupy makes whoa, dinosaur appear. This is only a few years ago. Well, I often ask people if they know a show on Netflix and they don't know it. I think people just don't want to put up their hand. Um, so proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Occupy movement. The Occupy movement recently was seen as an instantiation of this. So Occupy Wall Street. People literally occupied Wall Street. They went on it, they set up tents, and they said, you know, enough with this corruption. Wall Street and business is about big business, CEOs, inequality. Um, business, corporate America does not care about the interests of the every person. Um, they were using statistics such as, I, I believe, um, the, well, the 99.1%. Um, it was that 1% of the population um, has some huge proportion of, of all of the money. I don't remember the exact, the exact statistic, um, but essentially they were supporting Marx's claim that most of the people in a country are what he, der what he deemed the proletariat. They were individuals that could only live by selling their labor 
to someone else who was exploiting their labor power. Um, so the vast majority of people today, um, myself included, you know, I don't own some means of production. I have to work. I'm working for U of T right now as a student too. Um, but, but like anyone here that's working, um, I'm working for someone else. And if I don't do that, I would have to go on social assistance or something else and live a life that I don't really want um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so he said, if you see all societies, once they reach a, a certain level of technical development, technological development, as being seen as a property list class and a property class, so a class that has to labor for others, has to work for other, on other people's property, work in their factory, work at their university, versus people who control those things, you see that the assumption that conflict is at the core driving society, you see that that gains a lot more, more validity. Um, because not only will there be conflict between these two classes, but there will be conflict within the classes. So owners of factories will start to fight over which factory gains dominance, which productive mode is used. Um, when you see competitions between business, um, you know, Apple versus PC, these are examples in Marxist terms of uh, bourgeoisie industries competing over dominance of the society. Um, again, even of different universities, you know, which is the Harvard of the North? Is it U of T or McGill um, or neither? Um, or, or screw Harvard, what is it? Like, like, what, what are we thinking? These are, again, battles among uh, relative elites. Um, so seeing societies as, as this propertyless and propertied, uh, how this relates to the deeper philosophy about materialism that you might have read in the textbook, this puts tangible, objective stuff of society, so money, um, and jobs and things you can measure and survey as a sociologist, this puts these things at the center stage. So it says, rather than having these big philosophical discussions about how society works or going deep and philosophical, musing about the role of free will and agency and structure, we can look at societies in terms of the way they give resources to their population and we can see that it's unfairly divided and that it typically follows this pattern of people that are propertyless being relatively exploited by those with property. And then that makes the question of social change more relevant. Now, to a conflict theorist, how does society stay the way that it is? So if everything's all about conflict, that wouldn't that mean we're just fighting all the time and, and hating each other and uh, in a world of like frenemies and, and fakeness and stuff. Now, the ruling class, according to Marx and conflict theory, the way that this doesn't happen and the way that people can believe in harmony is through that word ideology that I mentioned as part of the superstructure. So an ideology and here you already mentioned this lovely, in a lovely manner, um, when discussing the latent functions of the education system. A conflict approach would see contemporary Canada, 2018, U of T, Scarborough, this class right now, they would see that everyone here is at least partly um, abiding by the ideology that you know, education is worth pursuing, merit exists, credentials are real. Um, so, and, and that, you know, grades, you should be trying to get them. Um, and I hope you believe that ideology. I want everyone to do well. Um, so the ideology is the set of beliefs and values that support and justify the ruling class. So just as I said, agency is structure, structured, and I, I built up to this example in the first class when I said, you know, I asked you for examples of agency, or, or the second class, and many of you said, um, you know, if you don't, part of you doesn't want to be in school or if you don't want to be in the classroom, you're tired, you go because you have a theory that going to class will yield you better grades and you'll learn something and those are all good things because we're living in a society where you're taught that education is a good thing. Um, so long story short, Marxists and conflict theorists argue that the conflict between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie or between warring classes is masked by the values and norms that a society has. 
And very importantly, rather than seeing the laws and values and norms as coming from everyone in a society, the way that Rousseau hoped, remember he said people are peaceful and they'll come together, conflict theories, theorists see these rules and laws as coming from the elites. Um, so the laws we have in a modern capitalist uh, society reflected in the vagrancy laws that I talked about, like anti-homelessness, those weren't instituted just by random people on the street, but they were by politicians and senators um, that were in a higher position, hierarchically. Um, so the terms false consciousness and class consciousness are related to this. Conflict theorists would critique um, functionalists by saying, you know, by being so fearful of change, you are not helping people become literally conscious of the fact that they are in potentially an underclass. And you're not letting them be conscious of the fact that social change may actually be very needed and warranted. Um, so false consciousness is the idea that, you know, someone, you'll see this later in the course, um, it, it's the idea that you accept your lot in life. Again, that's C. Wright Mills being so angry, calling people cheerful robots. Um, he saw someone that just blindly obeys society and says, yeah, I believe it's harmonious, and, and I think we're all in this conversation together. Um, a, a very extreme conflict theorist would say, no, you're falsely conscious, you think that that's good, but this is actually a question of power, and you're being exploited. Again, most people do not take such extreme, extreme positions, and it would be very nasty and elitist to say that to someone. Um, but again, these are to help you think through um, why these positions were formed. Again, Marx was, was writing in that room, being supported by Engels, and, and really upset seeing all of these people miserable, just like C. Wright Mills on his motorcycle, thinking, you know, oh, all these people don't, like, they're so hard on themselves, but it's actually society. So that's the context. That's why they... You know, people, people get really heated and more extreme when, when, uh, when they really think through these things. Um, okay, so now it's the short and sweet symbolic interactionism. Um, so functionalism and conflict theory, again, they're less intuitive because they're the two big binary poles. Symbolic interactionism is much more common sense. I think it's things that we all kind of think. Um, and, and it's a way of scientifically studying society without necessarily all the huge philosophical theoretical baggage that the other approaches have. Um, and it's not just that it's simpler. Symbolic interactionism, in its simplicity, or what's called pragmatism in philosophy, pragmatism uh, meaning you know, and not being all about intellectual symbols and systems, but actually just studying life as it is, Symbolic interactionism sees structure um, and institutions as both the product of human agency. So people create the institutions that, we're, that, that are around us, they create the social norms, but they see that those norms and institutions also interact, our, uh, also shape our behavior importantly. So rather than see structures as either causing our behavior or as being the cause of our behavior, they see them as ongoing accomplishments. So the education system, yes, it structures our decisions, what we want to do when we grow up, why we feel bad if we drop out of school. But it doesn't have to do that. We all have the ability to say at the same time, on a personal level, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to let that structure my agency. I'm going to drop out and do something else. Or start a social movement against education, which I talked to a student about. And maybe he'll do that in this class afterwards. Start a social movement and about publicizing education and leaving and, and, and shaking up the institution. Um, so symbolic interactionism, again, has, is seeing both of these things as related, not one of the other story. A key thinker here, we'll build our way up to Mead, who was kind of the pioneer of this. But thinker number three of that holy trinity is absolutely key in this. So Max Weber, who you'll recall from the previous week, was listed as a macro theorist, which he is. So he studied the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. He was wondering why modern capitalism stuck in certain countries and not others. And he said certain religious beliefs were amenable to it and others weren't. Again, Protestantism uh, helped labor. Um, people wanted to accumulate labor for God. 
uh, whereas you know, Confucianism um, was not as amenable to, to capitalism um, as people were less competition driven. Um, Max Weber, though, that, so that's half of his work, the macro work. Max Weber criticized Durkheim and he criticized Marx for being too cold in their approach, for being too focused on society and not on individuals. Now, it might sound strange that I'm calling Durkheim cold when he seemed the most emotional. He was interested in meaning and all that. But Durkheim, as you'll see in his book, The Rules of Sociological Method, he did not care at all about what anyone said or thought about society. He was quite clear in that. He said, people don't know what they think. They're so complex. They're driven by impulses. They're driven by norms. You can't find out anything from people as individuals. You can only find out about them through aggregates. That's why he was the founder of quantitative sociology. He said, I'm going to look at people's suicide rates. I'm not going to ask people why they're killing themselves. I'm going to look and see objectively why they're doing it. Um, Max Weber said, OK, fine. Well, you, that's good, and we need that. And I'm going to study Protestantism that way. But I also believe in this idea of Verstehen, a German word, or Verstehen. I don't know how to pronounce it. So, uh, and sorry, and just as an aside, it's Max Weber, pronounce it like a V, because it's a German word, um, or German name. Um, so deep understanding and interpretive of subjective social meanings. So Max Weber, so this is key for symbolic interactionism. He said that any social fact, institution, norm, and this is directly linked to manifest and latent functions, he said anything that's present in a society may have one direct meaning or one kind of meaning on the books, so education is designed to give people jobs and give them liberal educations and give them critical thinking. But using a Verstehen approach, if you go out and interview people and ask them, what do you really think of the education system? What have you learned? What do you expect when you go to class? You might find a whole bunch of other things. And so what this perspective of Verstehen does is link up directly to the symbolic interactionist, interactionist premise. Um, and you'll see in the textbook, I think there's, there's, um, there's like the seven principles of symbolic interactionism. Um, I didn't want to put that on the slide because I don't want you to make you think like, that you have to memorize all of them or anything. But the key assumption in symbolic interactionism comes down to George Herbert Mead's ideas of the self. And versus functionalism and conflict theory, which are really focused on society, Symbolic interactionism says you cannot understand society without understanding the self. And this is a more recent development in sociology, again, starting more in the 50s. And that's why now, as I said, um, and in terms of my own interest in psychology, sociology is increasingly converging with psychology because of symbolic interactionism in part. So why is it f fundamental for sociologists to look at the self? The argument, the long and short of it, is that the self, as Locke demonstrated um, years ago with the idea of the blank slate, which I said I would get back to, Locke demonstrated that our impulses, our drives, our personality, as much as some of this might be innate, the vast majority of, our, of ourselves are socially constructed. So Mead called this the me, or multiple me's. So how do I know what I want in life? How do I know who I am? I could make the case that I was born um, predisposed to video games, um, but you know, I, I don't th I know who I would convince with that. Much more likely, I've found video games attractive because of the circumstances I found myself in with my family and school and being a bit of an outsider, and I really drew myself to video games. And video games and gaming became my central me. So a me to me are the values and the ideas that you learn in a society that you start to identify with. So just like in everyday conversation, you, have a, you, you can refer to yourself as I and me, depending on the sentence, right? Um, so I am teaching this class. Um, but if you look at me, I'm an instructor. Now, it sounds like I'm just playing language games, but what, what the central distinction between the I and the me is, the me is the residue or the leftovers from the various experiences that you've had. 
So your sense of self is not just some innate thing based on how you were born, but it's the residue of everything you've done, what you've internalized, what you've come to believe. And the self and the me are historical, um, but they're not permanent. So just like how I have my conflicted relationship with video games, love it, hate it, all these things, that's because the other half of me is the I. It's the active self. I have a mind that I'm not in control of, um, and I find myself in different situations. I have you know, different friends, all of these things, and, I can't, and I'm not in totally control of myself, just as no one is. Um, and symbolic interactionists see um, human interaction then as key. So you have a bunch of individual selves that are partly spontaneous and biological and all of these things you might study more in like neuroscience, but you have a bunch of selves that are also me's. They're internalized values, internalized norms. Lawrence, born in 1800, could not have been a gamer because there weren't games. I mean, I could, have, I could have found some weird, maybe I would have been in like chariot racing or something. Um, but I, I mean, I doubt it because I was antisocial, so I don't, I don't know what I would have done. Maybe uh, mental games or something. But um, the me, me is historical. So historical in multiple senses, based on previous experiences, but also contextual. You would not be the same person that you are if you were born somewhere else, had different family, all of that. The I is, again, the more abstract self. That's the fact that you are not limited to what you've done, and you're not limited to what you've learned. You can change. You can reinterpret what you've done. So that is absolutely central. And how do you do that? So need is the one with the I and the me. Again, the spontaneous, active self, and then the residues of other experiences, what you've internalized. Again, your ideas about the education system. They're historical. You can change them. As you learn more in this course, you could come to, to you know, really love sociology or not. Um, that's, that's up for debate, right? Um, you have ideas now, and those can change. So Cooley, how does this process work? So he has three major terms. He says, well, as symbolic interactionists, um, we can see that the structures around us don't necessarily always have the same meaning for everyone, because you can literally put yourself in someone else's shoes. So the fact that people debate different points um, you can see that, for example, you know, in the same class, I know this because of teaching evaluations, um, one student could find the class exhilarating and think, oh, I'm speaking to them. Another could say, he's deluded out of his mind, he's totally out, off the wavelength of students. And I think, how is the same presentation read so differently? Well, different expectations, different interpretations. So the sympathetic introspection is me, rather than trying to demonize a student that doesn't like the class, um, which I really try not to do, I think, OK, how do I speak to that, to that kind of student? Being a theorist, I think every particular represents something bigger. So they're probably right. I'm probably going too fast. I know I have a tendency to do that. Or I'm rambling. That means I'm not explaining my train of thought very well. So I'm going to try to do that. I'll be, and I'll be sympathetic about my introspection. I won't be like malicious and say, ah, I don't care. Um, looking glass self, so related to that. The tendency of me that wants to be malicious is more like the conservative reaction out of fear. The looking glass self. Most of our perceptions about ourselves, ironically, are not from ourselves. They come from the fact that we are judged by other people. Um, so we develop our self-image through the cues we receive from others. Part of why a lecturer or a professor does not like people speaking in their class, yes, much of it is because we, don't, we want you to respect your space and not disturb one another. But when you're talking on your phone or shifting around and all of that, it cues to us that you're not interested. So even if I'm being sympathetically introspective and I'm thinking, oh, that student might just have a lot going on or whatever, they're not giving me a dirty look. Why would they do that? Um, you know, I don't know that because how do people learn? You learn by cues and reactions that are given to you by other people. Um, and I can, again, be introspective and think, no, oh, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure it's not me. Um, but if I keep doing that, then I would have no self-image and I would just think, oh, nothing anyone ever says to me is ever about me. It's always them. And, and that, you know, that I could become a monster. Um, lastly, self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so how do people form their sense of self and how do institutions stay the way they are? Symbolic interaction could be read or misread 
as everything is just being this kind of interpretive game, things are up for grabs. But as we know, um, many things do not change overnight. The education system is not going to go anywhere. This is related to the concept, or not anywhere overnight, I mean, or, or by tomorrow, you're, you know, this class will conclude itself, I hope. Um, the self-fulfilling prophecy is, as we live and we internalize these ideas, as I, people see me through my looking glass self, I realize the kind of cues that people give me, I feel I can interact with others, um, and I internalize that into my personality of my me of what Lawrence the instructor is. If I were repeatedly rebuked by students, which happens to some people, that's when they leave that, that institution and they say, okay, well, clearly people don't like me. I'm not going to do this. Um, so self-fulfilling prophecy, that's just an example, is all of the experiences that you have, you internalize them selectively into what a psychologist would call a personality. So again, at school, if you're severely bullied, you then might see yourself as unworthy um, or you might self-isolate. If you had a ton of friends, you may internalize the positive cues and have a very high self-image. Um, you know, someone that's more athletic in school is more likely to have that than someone who's in the chess club, right? Um, I mean, times are changing, uh, but those are just historical examples. Um, so feeding back to the big theoretical discussions with functionalism, um, you see the self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of their organic analogy. So remember, they said institutions change very slowly over time, and we shouldn't shake them up. They'll kind of just live according to their own volition. Conflict theorists, however, would not endorse the self-fulfilling prophecy. They would say, no, we have to short-circuit this, um, and we cannot let these things just run on their own course. Um, so lastly, so like anything, as I said, I unfortunately could not discuss every theorist that's relevant to sociology. There are literally hundreds because sociology draws on everything. So I just went according to the textbook um, and because I, I believe the textbook chose ones um, that are representative of other courses. Um, but I just want to go over three thinkers from, different from three different um, marginalized groups. And I mean marginalized from the discipline, historically. Um, so women scholars, visible minority scholars, and non-Western scholars. Because as you'll notice, obviously, Marx, Weber, Durkheim, Spencer, everyone was kind of a Western white male. Um, and that's just the history of the field, um, of what became dominant at the time. Um, so Harriet Martineau, um, who ironically actually was the translator of August Comte's work. Um, uh, du Bois, who wrote a fantastic work, um, very influential, and is becoming part of the canon now in sociology. Um, and Ibn Khaldun, um, a, a more closer to ancient thinker. So I'll just go over these quickly. Again, not to marginalize the thinkers that are already marginalized at the end of the course, but the, the for sake of time, unfortunately. Um, so Harriet Martineau. This is someone I studied very much. I'm writing a paper on her now. Um, Harriet Martineau, you can think of as being very similar. Uh, she's kind of like a, um, the female counterpart to Durkheim. Um, so she wrote very much on uh, social institutions. She was interested in Comte because of his idea of the three stages um, and the scientific revolution and, and kind of viewing society uh, scientifically or positively. Um, her, famous, her most famous work, she has two, um, two very famous ones, but her most famous, I think, was How to Observe Morals and Manners. Um, so she influenced qualitative sociology down the road by saying, how do we study the norms and customs, uh, what Durkheim called social facts, the, the parts of a society that, that you can see in the laws, the codes, the values. How do you actually study those as a sociologist? Um, so she is French, and she went to America, um, and, and she interviewed people, she observed people, she documented how laws and rules and codes changed over time. Um, and as a woman scholar at the time, she was very focused, as all the schol most scholars were focusing on men and boys, she was interested in looking at girls and women. Um, many of the male scholars, you know, they had awful things to say about women at the time of them being under-socialized and all of these things. And she wanted to go out and say, no, we're, we're the same. Um, and, and we're just treated differently because society, using the kind of functionalist idea, has evolved to a place that's not necessarily amenable to women. 
Um, and so she, she was part of uh, a key early uh, feminist movement. Uh, in the field and, and academia more generally, again, of A, proving that women could do the same kind of rigorous scientific research as men, and then B, um, focusing on women and showing they go through the same kind of social processes that men do. Um, du Bois, very similar. Um, he wrote more literary and philosophically. Um, his major, he was reflecting on slavery in the American context, and his central finding um, is this idea of double consciousness. And so he was very interested in, again, for, in, in radical kind of departure from the, the functionalist perspective. He said, he asked the empirical question of, you know, how does a person that is so utterly marginalized by society, so black slaves in America, how is it that they can see themselves as a citizen of the country, but also as a subaltern kind of demonized class? So a double consciousness, uh, he, he categorized as the ability to see yourself on the one hand as part of a group, but on the other hand as also um, being marginalized by that group. Um, so that's something that I think anyone can bring to their own life um, if you think of, of seeing your consciousness as double. So think of manifest and latent functions too. I see things in terms of definition A, but I also see it in definition B. Um, you know, I love my friend, but I hate the way they treat me in this one way. Um, or, so, you know, those, that's a more, this is a much more extreme and important case, what he, what he studied. Um, but he, he was very influential for symbolic interactionism of seeing, again, how is it that people make sense of these macro structures and so double consciousness was an early kind of social psychological concept focused on race, but that also helped to explain questions about gender. How do you see yourself as a woman if you're in a society um, where you're taught that you're supposed to be like a good mother and a stay-at-home kind of person, but then you, there's also been a feminist revolution and you want to work in the workplace? How do you, have, how do you balance what's called um, kind of the, the second shift? We'll learn that later. Um, and lastly, um, Ivan Keldon. So like Martineau, in, uh, influenced by Comte, um, he is often seen as the real kind of founder of sociology, um, but because he was not writing in a Western country and he wrote far earlier, um, he, was, he kind of disappeared from the canon. Um, the more people are re rediscovering his work um, and they're finding many things. So again, the two main major commonalities are Comte's three stages and Durkheim's discussion of the importance of social integration and religion. These are starting to be found very similar analogies um, in Ivan Keldon's work. Um, so these three thinkers, again, I think it's a good way of ending the lecture. Um, I can only include so much content. Um, but the reason I include these as well at the end is to say functionalism, symbolic interactionism, conflict theory, these happen to be the three kind of guiding theoretical schools or foundations for the discipline, um, but they're all just perspectives to see, to think through uh, sociological questions, which are namely, again, how is it that societies become what it is? How does society shape our behavior? And how do people interact? These are living questions, they're not dead. Um, and as we'll see next week with contemporary theory, um, you'll see some of these theories influenced contemporary, meaning people you know, writing after roughly 1950. Some of these theories influenced them more than others. Um, so what I would do is you, reading chapter three, because you have to do the quizzes anyway, read chapter three and really relate them to functionalism, conflict theory, symbolic interactionism, and kind of see which classics seem to be more alive in the contemporary era and think about why and think about things that have gone on um, and again just build and exercise that sociological imagination um, okay so thanks to so many of you for sticking around uh, sorry for going over time <laughs>